Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the Phoenicians. In this episode, An Empire of Trade, we will talk about how the Phoenicians rebuilt their international trade network in large part through the manufacturing and trade of purple dye. They also spread their alphabet and pantheon across the known world and founded the city of Carthage. To this day, we do not know what the Phoenicians called themselves. They likely didn't have a name for themselves as a broader group, but identified with a particular city-state, like Tyre or Sidon. In the Hebrew scriptures, also called the Old Testament, Phoenicia was called Canaan. The island city of Tyre and the mainland city of Sidon ranked among the most powerful and wealthy states within Phoenicia. Byblos and Baalbek served as religious centers for the region, with Byblos also serving as a center for the papyrus trade, with papyrus used to make writing parchment in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Historically, the city of Sidon, located in modern-day Lebanon, ranked first among the Phoenician cities. However, during the Iron Age, which took place after the Bronze Age collapsed in 1200 BC, it lost ground to its sister city, Tyre. This happened in part because Tyre formed an alliance with the Kingdom of Israel, which furthered Tyrian power by giving them yet more trade opportunities. Hoping for similar prospects, Sidon sought an alliance with Israel through marriage. The princess Jezebel married King Ahab of Israel, as described in the books of kings in the Bible. According to those writings, Jezebel refused to give up her pagan faith, which did not please her husband's subjects, most notably the Hebrew prophet Elijah. Elijah began denouncing Jezebel until he inspired a military leader named Jehu to seize the throne. And while this removed a pagan from the throne, it also ended trade between Sidon and Israel, while Tyre continued to flourish. Tyre became wealthy from the manufacturing of purple dye, used to color the robes of royalty. This provided the Phoenicians with the name we know them by today, with Phoenicians translating as purple people from Greek. Of course, this comes from the purple dye, which they made through their access to the Murex sea snail, a small meat-eating creature that killed other invertebrates by injecting them with neurotoxins. It lived around the shores of the eastern Mediterranean. When exposed to sunlight, the neurotoxins from the murex turned rich colors, ranging from pink to deep violet. Each tiny shell produced only a drop of dye, which drove the cost of making it so high that it sold for 20 times its weight in gold. It could take 20,000 murex snails to produce enough purple dye to color the trim on a pair of tunics. Purple dye became one of the most important exports of the Phoenicians. It also gave Tyre a reputation as one of the most foul-smelling cities in the ancient world, where workers toiled away in a miasma of rotting sea snails to extract the dye. First, workers had to catch huge numbers of snails by lowering baskets baited with frogs and mussels into the sea. Then they raised up the baskets and crushed the smaller murex shells whole while merely extracting the poison glands of the larger creatures. Workers then soaked the poison glands in salt water for days. After it turned the right color, they tested the liquid by dipping wool into it. If the test went well, the dyers heated the dye and they made it the best possible shade of purplish red, a color fit for kings to wear. To make sure the dye kept its color over a long sea voyage, they treated it with seaweed alkali. About 8,000 pounds of murex pulp would produce 500 pounds of purple dye. It was hard, hot work, but it made the masters of the dye trade some of the richest men on earth. Not surprisingly, the city fathers of Tyre kept every step of the manufacturing process a state secret. 
Though the secret of making purple dye was discovered independently in China and Peru, the secret was kept in the Mediterranean region until the Roman era, when Pliny the Elder broke up the Tyrian monopoly by publishing their dyeing process for all to read and use. The Phoenician city-states like Sidon, Tyre, and Arvad soon established their niche as merchants in the Iron Age, though they faced more competition for um, the Greeks. Generally speaking, the Phoenicians transported luxury goods from the great kingdoms of the Near East to relatively minor powers in Greece and Italy. Then they brought back raw materials to Thebes and Babylon to be made into goods. These trade routes took them across the eastern Mediterranean to Cyprus, mainland Greece, Egypt, and Crete. However, they also went as far west as Britain, where the tin mines of Cornwall provided a natural resource that lured traders to the British Isles as early as the Bronze Age and continued to lure East Roman merchants as late as the early Middle Ages. In the years following the Bronze Age collapse, the Phoenicians also began to move away from using Mesopotamian cuneiform writing. Rather, they created an alphabet with only 22 letters, themselves simplified versions of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Cuneiform and hieroglyphic writing required a different character for each word or idea, which meant a language with thousands of words. By breaking language down into 22 sounds that could be easily memorized and used, the Phoenicians brought about a dramatic change in world literacy, making it possible for many more people to read and write than before. By 800 BC, the Phoenician alphabet spread to mainland Greece, where the Greeks readily adapted it to their language. The Greeks also added four new characters to create a 26-letter alphabet, which soon spread to Italy and eventually Rome. To this day, the Phoenician alphabet forms the basis of Latin and the Romantic languages. Ironically, little Phoenician writing exists today. While they kept extensive records of trade, the Phoenicians wrote on papyrus, and because of Phoenicia's damp climate, these parchments often rotted away. And because of this, most of what we know about the Phoenicians comes from other nations' writings. Like almost all nations of the Iron Age, which began after the Bronze Age collapse, the Phoenicians were polytheists. The main gods of their pantheon included Baal, the father god, and Tanit, the mother of heaven, who was the goddess of both love and motherhood. It was believed among the ancients that Phoenician women were stronger and braver because of the blessings of Tanit. As they founded colonies across the Mediterranean, the first building created by the Phoenicians was usually the temple. In part because of this piety, Phoenician deities influenced other nations, who sometimes incorporated Phoenician gods into their pantheons. There are also some similarities between the Phoenician gods Baal and Yam and the Greek deities Zeus and Poseidon, leading some scholars to wonder if the Greeks also got their gods from the Phoenicians along with their alphabet. Indeed, the Phoenician religion also taught of an upcoming battle between Baal and Yam, which bore some similarities to the apocalypse described in the New Testament. Around this time, the Phoenicians also founded the city of Carthage, located in modern-day Tunisia, most likely as a trading post. According to mythology, Carthage was founded in 814 BC by Queen Dido, originally a princess from the Phoenician city of Tyre. Her father, King Belius, planned to divide Tyre between Dido and her brother Pygmalion. However, Pygmalion seized the throne after his father's death and then murdered Dido's husband Psycheus as part of his plan. However, Psycheus thwarted Pygmalion's plan to murder his sister Dido by appearing to her in a dream and warning her of her brother's plan. Dido escaped by sailing across the Mediterranean with her followers in search of a new home. And in time, the Tyrian refugees arrived in North Africa where they founded the city of Carthage. 
Virgil, the author of the epic poem The Aeneid, further embellished this tale by telling of another refugee, the Trojan hero Aeneas, who fled the destruction of Troy by the Greeks some years later. During his journey, Aeneas and his men traveled to Carthage, where he met Queen Dido. Dido fell in love with Aeneas, but the Trojan insisted on continuing with his mission to find a new homeland for the Trojan refugees. When he left, Dido committed suicide in despair. In time, Aeneas founded the city of Rome in Italy, and Carthage went on to become a great maritime and merchant power, much like its parent nation of Tyre and later generations of Romans used this story to explain the historical hatred between Rome and Carthage. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.